No. All right, Galatians chapter 3. And we'll just uh, going to read verse 10 to get started. And then we'll go down through several verses. It says in verse 10, Galatians 3, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Heavenly Father, help us as we study together tonight that we'll be able to understand. Most of us know the basics of this uh, message that will be preached tonight. But remind us of these things. And many who will be uh, watching by video or, or uh, going on to YouTube or whatever, we pray that you'll bless uh, them. Uh, that they might uh, hear and understand if they're not saved. Maybe they'll trust you as personal Savior and be saved. So thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number one, the certainty of the curse. And it says there, it says, uh, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Um, and he says, As many as are of the works of the law. Those are the people who are under the law. Now you're familiar with the scripture that says we are not under the law, but we're under grace. But those that are under the law, they are the ones who are depending on the law to save them. Uh, now, to, to these people, most of, it seems to me that most of the people in Galatia and those churches were Jews. And uh, the law to them would be uh, the ceremonial law. And, uh, you know, the, the killing of the lamb and the sprinkling of the blood and all that kind of thing. And uh, the people, he says those that are under the law, uh, uh, he says they're cursed under the law. Why are they cursed? Because when, when we're born, we're under the curse. Adam was sure of that, made sure of that when he sinned against God. When he, uh, and it was strange because, you know, Brother uh, Brown, Brother Steve, told us one time, he said, you know, somebody said something about his wife, said, I don't want to listen to my wife. Brother Brown said, you know, God told Abraham, Abraham, hearken to your wife. I thought that was pretty good. Yeah. But then I was reading in Genesis yesterday. <laughs> And uh, it said, uh, let me see, who was it now? It was uh, because he hearkened to his wife. God cursed him because he hearkened to his wife. I'll tell you who it is in a little while if I think about it. I know who it is. But just my, and, and so I don't know whether to hearken to my wife or not. Of course, I, I never did much anyway. <laughs> uh, she harped at me, and I usually hearken, so that's the way it usually happens, isn't it? But it says, cursed are those people who are under the law. And Adam, yeah, it was Adam. He hearkened to his wife. That, and the God said, that's what happened to you. You hearkened to your wife. Your wife gave you the, the apple or whatever it was, and you ate it. And boy, you know what that did? That put every one of us under the curse of the law, under the, the curse of uh, the law. And uh, the Bible says, as many as are of the works of the law, um, that uh, they, uh, they continue not in all things that are written in the book of the law, they're cursed. So all of these who are born under the law are under the curse. Now, if you have a, a Bible there and you can turn to it, Deuteronomy 27, I'd like for you to turn because I'm going to read several verses. And this is a striking passage of Scripture because the word uh, cursed or cursed, depending on how it's used in the sentence, some pronounce it one way, some another. I think I'm from Kentucky, so I'll say Cursed. I think the, the, uh, the uh, highbrow people say cursed, you know, cursed or cursed, the same word. Look at verse 15, Deuteronomy 27 and verse 15. There are 12 curses here under the law. Verse 15 says, cursed or cursed, I, I'll wind up saying cursed, be the man that maketh any graven or molten image an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsman, and putteth it in a secret place, and all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Now, I'm probably going to leave that last part off because every one of them ends the same way. Verse 16, Cursed be he that setteth light by his uh, father or his mother. In other words, makes light of them. Verse 17, uh, Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark. In other words, you move somebody's fence and you steal some of their property. Verse 18, Cursed is he be he that maketh the blind to wander out of the way. Now, wouldn't that be cruel? Instead of t uh, telling a blind man to go the right way, you have him to go the wrong way and make him trip over something or something like that. And uh, verse 19, uh, Cursed is he that perverteth the judgment of a stranger, fatherless and widow. 
Verse 20, Cursed be he that uh, lieth with his father's wife, because he uncovereth his father's skirt. Verse 21, Cursed be he, be he that lieth with any manner of beast. Verse 22, Cursed be he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother. Verse 23, Cursed be he that lieth with his mother-in-law. Verse 24, Cursed be he that smiteth his, his neighbor secretly. Verse 25, Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person. Verse 26, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And all the people shall say, Amen. That's, that's the hard part. That's what got them in trouble. It doesn't matter what you say, Moses. We're going to do it. Well, cursed is it if you do this or if you don't do that. Cursed if you do this or don't do that. They said, Amen. And all the people shall say, Amen. But it's not the doing of the law, but it's the not doing of the law that brings the curse. Did you ever think about that? It's not the doing of the law, but the not doing of the law. It's not keeping the commandments. It's not the keeping of commandments. It's not something you do. It's something you don't do. Now, you know, we usually think of something you don't do as being negative or passive. But it's what you don't do that brings the curse. Now, those who had the faith of Abraham and believed God were delivered from this curse of the law. Through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where we're going, we want to concentrate our thoughts tonight. Point number two in verse 11, the certainty of faith. We have the certainty of the curse now. And that's under the law. Anyone who's under the law is under the curse. Now about the certainty of faith. He says in verse 11 of Galatians 3, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. Now, it may not have been evident to everybody, because everybody doesn't know the Bible, everybody doesn't know the Scriptures. But it's evident, if you know anything about God and about the Bible and about the Jewish religion, you know the just shall live by faith. And why, how do they know that? Especially Israel knew that in uh, New Testament times. The Galatians knew that. And, and why? Because that started with Abraham. That phrase started with Abraham, I should say, clause. That clause started with Abraham. And they say they were Abraham's children. Now, I know faith was there before. I know people believed in the Lord before Abraham. But Abraham is the first one, the Bible says, that he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And uh, so first, notice in this verse that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. Now, he can be justified in the sight of men by the law. The Pharisees, the people looked up to them and they honored them because they kept the law. They were called strictest. They were called separatists because they separated themselves from everybody else and made themselves higher than everybody else. And they put on their garb and they talked a certain way and they prayed long prayers and they gave tithes of mint and rue and anise and all that kind of thing. And, and uh, they, they praised themselves. And remember that uh, the Pharisee went up to the temple to pray and he says, I'm thankful that I'm not uh, like this publican and, and all that. That's the kind of praise they got. And so uh, the Bible says uh, that, uh, uh, that, they're not just a, that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. We might be justified by the law in the sight of Israel or in the sight of uh, people, but not in the sight of God. Acts 13, 39 says, And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which we could not be justified by the law of Moses. And so what justifies us? What, what, how are we justified? Well, we know we're justified by faith. Romans 5, I don't have that here, but Romans 5, 1 tells us that. Being justified, therefore, by faith, we have peace with God. That's what verse 1 says of Romans 5. Um, Galatians 5, 4 says, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So if you're justified by the law, Christ has nothing to do with it. Christ is out of the picture. Christ may have stayed, may as well have stayed in heaven. He may as well have never come to the earth. He may as well have never died on the cross or gone to the grave or resurrected or gone back to heaven. He may as well just be out of the picture completely and never have even existed at all. Because if you can be justified by the law, big deal. It has nothing to do with Christ. He has become of no effect to you, whosoever is justified by the law, and you're fallen from grace, which means you've turned away from grace and gone a different way and you're trying to be justified by the law. 
Now, second, under this point, it's evident that the just shall live by faith. Now, there are several times, and if you want to jot these scriptures down, uh, you might want to do that because we're not going to have time, I don't think, to turn to them, each one. But in the Old Testament, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, nobody can find the book of Habakkuk in their Bible, so don't even try to turn it. <laughs> and then, especially if you don't know how to spell it. Nobody knows how to spell it. And most people don't know how to pronounce it, but none, nonetheless. Chapter 2, verse 4, it says this. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. By his faith. Now remember, when God gives you faith, it's your faith. See, when you believe, it's you who believe. God doesn't believe for you. Christ doesn't believe for you. It's a gift of God, says Ephesians 2, 8. It's a gift of God, but it's yours. Once he gives it to you, it's your faith. And you are justified by that faith. Uh, and uh, so then we have three times in the New Testament that this same quotation is written down. Romans 1, 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed uh, from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So he's quoted it again. Habakkuk said it. Paul said it in Romans 1, 17, the just shall live by faith. But notice it says from faith to faith. That is, from today till tomorrow to tomorrow to tomorrow, you live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Uh, and then here in our text, it says, uh, but that no man is justified by the law on the side of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 10, 38 says, now the just shall live by faith, for if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So there's four times that that exact phrase, except for Habakkuk, says his faith, that exact phrase is quoted both in the Old Testament and three times in the New Testament. So it must be a pretty important uh, phrase or clause. Um, in Habakkuk, we uh, read his faith. Now, first, the law was given to Israel for them to keep. They were supposed to keep the law. Second, faith is given to every child of God, and it's our responsibility to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because faith without works is dead. So just as the law was given to Israel to work out and to keep every aspect of it, and if you break one, you've broken the whole law. We know that from James 2.10. Uh, also, if you have faith, you're supposed to work out that faith. If you have law, you work out the law. If you have faith, you work out the faith. See, the Bible tells us that we, the just shall live by faith. Not rest, not sleep, not backslide, not commit sin, but to live by faith. And so uh, the word live in uh, the just shall live by faith is a present tense verb, which means that it goes on and on and on. That's how we're supposed to live, 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 live uh, by faith. Now, it's supposed to live one day and walk up an aisle and make a profession of faith and get baptized and, and sit down for the rest of the service and then never go back to church again. That's not what it's all about. It's about live by faith, present tense. On and on and on and on. Point number three, the certainty of the law, verse 12. Galatians 3, 12. And the law is not of faith. <laughs> that does, does that shock you? It doesn't shock me because we've been reading about it. But the man that doeth them shall live by them, or shall live in them, this passage says. Uh, so the law is not of faith. The requirement to keep the law comes with birth. When you were born... You were supposed to, you, you had to keep the law. You were under the law, so you were supposed to keep the law. But you never could. It never was. You were never were able to keep the law. Nobody can keep the law because we're sinners. We've already sinned against God. The Bible says, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the uh, glory of God and do come short of the glory of God. So we're all sinners. And so the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Every Israelite was responsible to keep the law perfectly. Secondly, the law is a responsibility. The man that does them, that is the commandments, shall live by them or in them. It was required of every Jew to keep every law that God laid down. And what did they say? Amen, we'll do it. They said to Moses, you go up in the mountain, see what God wants, come back down, tell us, we'll do it. Whatever God said, we're going to do it. And they made a covenant with God that we'll keep every law that you, that you uh, write down, God. And... Uh, before he ever got down from the mountain, they had already broken the laws, <laughs> already broken their covenant. 
And that's the way we are. We're sinners. We're, we, we, we break God's laws all the time. But aren't you glad that you're not under the law? Because you have to keep every one of those laws. If you're under the law, you can't break even one of them. Because if you break one of them, you've broken the entirety of the law, and you're guilty before God, you're responsible before God, and you're going to hell when you die. That's just the simplicity of it. But aren't you glad you're under grace? If you're under grace, the law has no more dominion over you. Death has no more dominion over you. And so we're thankful for that. Uh, and we know, of course, James 2.10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, is guilty of all. Point number four, the certainty of redemption in Christ. This, this is the good part. <laughs> Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, you know, we just read that if you're under the law, you're in, under the curse. But here, he says, Christ hath redeemed us, bought us, purchased us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. And so there, there is a curse in the Old Testament of everyone who hangs on a tree. So it's not by what we've done, but what Christ has done for us that brings redemption and justification and salvation. So now we have Christ in the picture. You know, if we're saved by the law, Christ had not, not effect to us. Christ might as well be gone. Might, might just erase him from history and from everything, from the gospel, from everything. But he redeemed us from the curse of the law. And so now we're not under the curse of the law, but we're under uh, the redemption in Christ Jesus. And it's not by what we do, because Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. And how was that done? Well, by the Holy Spirit of God, by God himself, and by Jesus Christ. So Christ is in the picture, isn't he? If Christ is not in the picture, there is no redemption. Now, the Bible says that Christ was made a curse for us here in verse 13. Christ was made a curse. Cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree. And I'm going to read this to you from Deuteronomy 21, 23. It says, His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So everybody in Israel who was hanged on a tree was under a curse. Cursed everyone that hanged on a tree. And notice that it says hanged. It doesn't say hung. Hung means they hung you up on a tree. Hang means they killed you. They crucified you. And so cursed is everyone who is crucified upon a tree. And guess what Christ was? He was crucified upon a tree. He died on the tree. And he was cursed. Well, how would he be cursed? How would he be under the curse? He didn't do any sin. There's no sin in Christ. How could he be cursed? Well, you and I know that. We know that that he took our sins upon him and he became a curse for us, as our, as our verse here says. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon the tree. Now, point number five, the certainty of Abraham's promise. Verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. It's, it's a little bit long to try to discuss all this about the, the Gentiles, but Abraham did not represent only the Jews. Abraham represented Jews and Gentiles. Because when Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, it was 430 years before the law ever came, the Mosaic law ever even came. And so the Bible tells us, which we may discuss in just a couple minutes, uh, how that when the law came, it could not disannul the promise that God gave to Abraham 430 years before. So if we're saved by the law, then the law took the preference over the promise that God gave to Abraham, which in our uh, words would be salvation by grace through faith. Because Abraham was saved by faith. And so it says the blessing of Abraham, verse 14, might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You see that word promise there? Hebrews 8, 6 says, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, talking about Christ, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Keep that word promise in your mind. 
because we're not saved by law, we're saved by promise through the grace of God by faith. And so the law covenant was made to vanish away. It was not eternal. The law that God gave to Israel was a law that was to be banished and got rid of and gone away with because it pictured the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he came and when he fulfilled the law, the law was done away with. It vanished away. It's gone. And so there is a better covenant. Romans 8, 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So I, I've told you several times about those two laws. There's a law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which is our law, which is God's law, which is Christ's law. But then he says, uh, Romans 8, 2, he says, uh, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. When we were under the law, we were under the law of sin and death. But the Bible says the law, the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from that. Freed me from the law. Free from the law, oh, blessed, re whatever that word is. You know that song, don't you? Yeah, free from the law. So when Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, he was obeying the gospel. You know how you obey the gospel? You believe. Isaiah 53 says, and they have not all, not all obeyed the gospel. And it's quoted again in Romans chapter 10. They have not all obeyed the gospel. Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? That's how they disobeyed the gospel. They didn't believe the report. And so Abraham believed, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham didn't have any righteousness. He was just a sinner just like you and I are. Nothing special about Abraham except God used him as a great example. He was the father of the Jewish nation. He's the father of the faithful. He's a great man. God used him in a great way. But Abraham didn't die for me. <laughs> and he didn't die for Israel. Uh, Abraham was not a, a great man as far as that kind of thing was concerned. But he was a man that God used in a very special way. Uh, his faith pointed to Jesus Christ. And Abraham was justified by that faith in Jesus Christ. Now, the Old Testament doesn't say he believed in Jesus Christ. But in what else would he have believed? Because the whole Bible is, being filled, is filled with believing in Jesus Christ. Uh, we were talking a while ago, and I, I said to the ladies, I said, and, and I've told you a number of times, and you already know this, that faith has to have an object. You have to believe in something. You don't just believe. You believe in something. And so our faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the object of our faith. And so the covenant here with Abraham reached beyond his own blood descendants. You see, those people in the New Testament, many of them, they thought that they were right with God and going to heaven when they die because they were descendants of Abraham. And Jesus said, no, that's not going to get you there. No. Because I was before Abraham. Before Abraham was, I am. And so he was the eternal one. And Romans 10, 12 says there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all them that call upon him. And that means that Abraham represented the Jew and the Gentiles. You know how he represented the Jew? He was circumcised. That was a sign that he was the father of the Jewish nation. The circumcision didn't save him. It was just a, it was an affiliation with God's chosen nation. But that's not what saved him. He believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now then, let's go into verse 15 through 18. I'm going to read all of them together. Uh, because of time mainly. And if you'll follow with me there in verse 15. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant. Yet if it be confirmed... No man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now this covenant that God made with Abraham, it was a man's covenant. It didn't matter. Because it was confirmed. We call that an oath. It was an oath. Verse 16 says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. So see, Abraham pointed directly to Christ. Verse 17, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. That's what I've been talking about. The law could not disannul the promise that God made to Abraham. 
We're not depending on the law. We're depending on that promise that God made in Abraham. Believe in me and I'll give you eternal life. That's what he says to us. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. So then the law, then being 430 years after God's covenant with Abraham, could not disannul or destroy that promise that he made with Abraham. Verse 18 says that God gave inheritance to Abraham by promise, not by law. Verse 15 says that this man uh, was a man, this was a man's covenant, but it was confirmed and that was an oath. And so what I want to do in closing, I want to go to the book of Hebrews, and you can turn there with me, because I'm going to read verse 13 down through verse number 15 to sort of bring this to a conclusion. Verse 13, Hebrews 6, verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. You know, when you look around, you say, uh, who am I going to swear this by? And he looked around and... <laughs> And looked down from heaven to see, you know, who was righteous. There was none righteous. He looked to see who was searching God. Nobody was searching God. He looked to search who was good. Nobody was good. You know. So he swore by himself. Because he was the greatest there was. Now, I don't think that actually happened. I don't think that. I think that's just telling us that God is the greatest. Verse 14. Saying, surely blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For, for men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. So there's your oath right there. Confirmation, see? That's your oath. Verse 17. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of the counsel, that means it can't be changed, confirmed it by an oath. There's your oath. That by two immutable things, two unchangeable things, what are they? The oath and the promise. The oath and the promise. Two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. And that's why he could swear upon himself. Because it's impossible for him to lie. If you swear to me for something, you could lie about it, you know. I swear if you'll give me $1,000, I'll give you $1,500 in two weeks. And I never see you again. And that's just the way people are sometimes, you know. But by two immutable things, in which it's impossible with God to lie, we might have a strong consolation. How much stronger can you get a consolation than to know that we're saved by a promise, that we're saved by grace through faith, that we're not saved by the law, but we're saved by a promise and by the oath of God and and the covenant of God with his people. And it says, who have fled for refuge or safety. We have fled. We ran to Christ. We have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Now Abraham saw hope. And he rushed to it. And he captured it. And he kept it. And he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. Now he didn't see that city. He didn't know anything about that city. But evidently, God told him about the city some kind of a way. He didn't look for the promised land. He, didn't, he wasn't going to go into Canaan, and he wasn't going to be part of that 12, those 12 tribes that had taken, taken over that land. No, his city, he's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And that wasn't Canaan. It's another city. And that's where our hope is. We fled for refuge. And... They, we lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. Our hope is sure and steadfast. It's a guarantee. Because when Jesus made that covenant, he made it by promise. And his promise is good. And he's unchangeable. He can't change it. I can't change it. You can't change it. The Bible won't change it. The Holy Spirit won't change it. So our faith in Christ is steadfast. And our hope is eternal. Aren't you glad you're saved? If you're not saved, trust him tonight. He'll save your soul. And you'll have that assurance, that consolation of those two immutable things, the oath and the promise. Let's stand together and be dismissed in prayer.